Good afternoon, St. Pete. I'm Dr. Kanika Tomlin, Deputy Mayor and City Administrator of this awesome place that we call home. Happy New Year, Happy New Decade, and welcome to the State of the Economy 2019. We share the economic update in the new year so that we're able to provide a full picture of the previous year. And you know, this is the fifth year that we've gathered to present a snapshot of our community's economic landscape. It's the fifth time that we've gathered to talk about population, revenue drivers, jobs trajectories, and all of the other indicators of our performance. Our 2014 numbers set the benchmark, and here we are in 2020, half a decade later looking back. So you know what that means, friends. We've got ourselves a trend. And what a beautiful trend it is. But Alan Delisle, our city development administrator, will tell you more about that in just a few minutes. First, I want to tell you that Mayor Rick Kreisman and I are so pleased and so proud to see so many colleagues, partners, and investors in our economy here today. Thank you all for being here. We filled the room with RSVPs the day we began to take them. And that level of engagement is great news for our community, and we're seeing comparable levels of engagement with various initiatives across various topics all across our city. It's a great time to call St. Pete home. And while it's the brilliant expertise, no doubt, of our economic development team, and partnership with our top-notch marketing crew that produces the state of the economy. It's our entire City of St. Pete team that plays host to today's event because it takes every one of us to deliver the service that underpins the outlook we celebrate today. I see members of the Mayor's Cabinet here and all members of our City team, please stand or raise your hands. Be recognized for the great work you do every day. The mayor and I are so proud of your work and honored to lead your, lead your efforts. We also have our city council here today, many members, including our chair, Ed Montaneri. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Vice Chair, Gina Driscoll. And council members, Deborah Fick Sanders. Robert Blackman. And Darden Wright. Thank you all for being here. Are there any other elected officials here with us today? Understanding the status and trends of our local economy and our comparative place as considered against those cities that aspire to like goals and growth is one of the most important things we can do as a community. It informs our goals, affirms our progress, and incentivizes our continued focus on those things that will make a difference. And man, are we making a difference. And both the private and the public sector, you can see it everywhere you look. If construction crews are an indicator of a city's economic outlook, then things are looking pretty nice in the Berg. I have the hard hat hair to prove it. I haven't had a good hair day in two years because I spend all my time on construction sites. And as you will hear Alan talk about and share the five-year trend, you'll see that we're not only building our city's places in remarkable ways, but we're building her people as well. And that should make us proud. You'll see charts that show we are a younger, more educated city, which means more high-skill, high-wage jobs, which equals a more resilient economy. You'll see poverty decreasing in our city faster than it is among our peers, and jobs being created at a steady, sustainable pace. You'll see opportunities sprouting from seeds that have been planted in every corner of our community from Gateway to the Skyway Marina District. And you'll realize that it's partnership, effort, strategy, and vision that are producing these results. Not serendipity, not luck. So these are sustainable outcomes that we can expect to continue as long as we continue to roll up our sleeves and come together as a community to do what's best for our community. And 
And that's pretty much the end of the editorializing that you'll hear from this podium today until the mayor comes up a little later and shares his thoughts at the end of the program. But the bulk of today is not about opinions, even though there are so many and they would mostly be glowing. But the state of the economy is an unpositioned, unbiased presentation of the indicators of our economic landscape. It's just the facts. It's comprised of third party, publicly accessible data from a variety of sources. And the sources are identified on each slide. And the entire presentation will be made available for you after today on the city's website. So there's no need for notes. All you have to do now is listen, learn about this awesome economy we are enjoying, and prepare to be wowed. Now partners play a key role in the success of today's gathering. We're especially grateful to Duke Energy, the underwriter of today's networking reception, and to our host, the James Museum of Western and Wildlife Art. Please help me now welcome Laura Hine, Executive Director of this important cultural asset. Thank you, Dr. Tomlin, and thank you everyone for being here. We're very excited to welcome the city and all those who participate in the city and care about it. Since it is an economic summit, I thought I would briefly mention the importance of arts and culture in driving economy. And I'm gonna do that through speaking about three different groups of people. One, those who visit here, two, those who live here, and three, those who are educated here. The people who visit here, any tourist that is coming and visiting an arts and culture destination spends an incremental 60% more than another kind of tourist. That's 60% more in our restaurants, our shops, our hotels, and it doesn't just benefit retail because of course all of those corporations are having to hire marketing, signage, services, have employees, et cetera. So that 60% increment can make a difference. To those of us who live and work here, when you visit a museum, you are typically open, inspired, it invites reflection, it invites dialogue and thoughtfulness, and oftentimes inspiration. Those kinds of feelings, that kind of recharging, that kind of openness, when you go back to your workplace, is gonna make you a more inspired leader, a more inspired, um, participant in your workplace. So I would argue that arts and culture helps drives productivity for those of us who live and work here as well. Third, those of us who are educated here. I'm proud to be working with the Pinellas County School System and how we figure out that every single student gets to visit an arts and culture destination during every single school year. We have so many places in this county and we know what that does for, for um, children. And you shouldn't have to go to a special magnet school or a certain kind of school that focuses this. We know that arts, culture, music are important for all, 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 all children. The last thing I just wanna say is I wanna encourage each of you who are here today to visit a museum. I was visiting a friend in a hospital the other day and the nurse said to me, oh, I can't go to a museum, I have four kids. <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, you can. Every museum in this town has children's programs. We, we, we have a baby play date program here, so even ages zero to three. Every single one. Bring children, bring family, bring visitors, and most importantly, just go yourself. As a uh, Army Airborne Qualified Naval Academy graduate, uh, recovered type A, I can tell you that um, visiting art museums has opened my mind and opened my heart and led to a beautiful life that I couldn't imagine otherwise. So each of you who are here, who are producers and drivers, visit a museum. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Laura, so much. Our uh, city is a city of the arts, and we're so proud of our museums, and we're so proud of the role that they play in our cultural landscape, and that it is a place that everyone's born uh, welcome from the day they're born uh, throughout their lives. So thank you very much for setting that tone. And thank you for your contributions to our community and especially uh, this event today. Now partners, colleagues, investors, and friends, let's get to the numbers. Many of you, I'd venture to say, most of you in this room know Alan Delisle. You know he's a force of nature with a hand in everything that is booming in the burg. Alan is the leader of our economic development and jobs creation team. He also leads transportation, enterprise facilities, event management, and so much more. He brings great enthusiasm 
and expertise to his work every day in a way that makes me call him a tireless titan of transformation. Today, he's going to give us all the scoop on the state of our city's economy, so I will also call him the bearer of good news. It is my pleasure to hand over the podium to our city development administrator, Alan Delisle. So this is always impossible to follow the deputy mayor after she puts so, those words together so nicely. Not just because it was about me, by the way. Um, but uh, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to go through this presentation. In certain sections, I'm going to be quick about it. Um, in some areas, I'm going to take a step back and uh, explain it a little bit more from our perspective. Uh, the purpose, though, as the deputy mayor indicated, we started this five years ago. We now have five years of trend analysis. So what you're seeing is really the story uh, at this point. It's where we're headed. Uh, it's third-party objective analysis, so it's, it's not uh, coming from the city. It's coming from the federal and state government for the most part. Um, we will throw in uh, clearly some of the policies, some of the programs that the mayor is delivering or the council is delivering uh, throughout, so you get a flavor of that. So let me start. with population. Um, before I do this though, I do want to introduce, uh, and then I swear we'll get to the numbers, I do want to introduce some very important people uh, who are in the City Development Administration every day, leading these departments and doing the hard work, the grunt work, uh, to make things come out positive for job growth and for private sector investment it's because these people are working behind the scenes every day. If they could just stand and acknowledge, Joe Zioli, our Managing Director of Administration and Finance, Joe's the money guy, we don't do anything without getting Joe's hand in it. Chris Balestra, Director of EFD. Liz Abernathy, Director of Planning and Construction Services. Evan Morey, Director of Transportation and Parking. Sophia Sorolis, Director of Economic and Workforce Development. Alfred Wendler, Director of Real Estate. Tony Lino, Director of Event Recruitment and Management. Vicki Such, who is our Administrative Support Manager. Nothing really happens without Vicki. And I do want to acknowledge Brian Caper, uh, who is our Economic Development Officer and has done an amazing job putting this information together. This does not come from me, it comes from Brian. Um, Brian, I'm not saying that if anything's wrong. <laughs> and I also want to mention that um, our marketing department, uh, led by uh, Nina Mamoudi and her team, has really helped to shape this whole event. So please, if we could, if those people could stand and join us. <laughs> to the numbers, population has increased. Uh, population has increased over the five years to the tune of about 5%, which means about a 1% increase in population a year. Pinellas County has increased in population 3.5%. The United States overall has increased in population a little under 3%. So in, economic in the economic development world, you've got to have population increase so that spending increases and uh, the likelihood of commerce increasing. It's not wild growth, though. I know a lot of people think that there's some wild growth out there. There's not. Uh, if you compare that to Seattle, which is 14%, uh, you, you can't compare that. Let's look at our impact on, on the county, our share of the county in terms of population growth. And this says we're doing something right, because people are moving to St. Petersburg because of the energy and what they get out of it. 40% of the growth in the county of Pinellas has come from St. Petersburg. And this just looks at the comparison of our peers, which gets to my, my broader point about not wild growth. As you can see, we've got about 5.4% uh, 5, 5 growth over five years, and you can see where our peers are. The MSA, uh, 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 has more growth than, than that, so does the city of Tampa, but you can see that United States is below us. 
net migration, where are these people coming from? Uh, in short, in Pinellas County, uh, most of the people coming to Pinellas County and therefore St. Petersburg, uh, because this information only came uh, as it relates to county, um, is coming from other states within the United States. Uh, but you can see for Hillsboro, uh, there's slightly more coming from international uh, individuals. So that's a little difference between us and Hillsboro. And then before we go into some of the more um, socioeconomics numbers that talk about who we are, um, I wanted to just point out that we've got a very important effort going on right now, the 2050 initiative. Has anybody participated in the 2050? Oh, oh that's a good show of hands. That's terrific. 2050 is very important. It's not about what, who are we in 2050, it's about who are we over the next 30 years. And um, Liz Abernathy and Derek Kilborn are leading that effort along with the mayor and the deputy mayor. Uh, we've got a lot more community events coming up in January and February. And this will be completed by the end of the year. So don't wait with your opinions and your views. Socioeconomics, demographics, age, what do we look like? Who are we in St. Petersburg? And what does it mean to our economy? Well, first of all, we're getting younger. You didn't know that, did you? You thought we were getting older, but no, we're getting younger because more and more younger people are moving to St. Petersburg. So in the 70s, we were about 48 years on average, years old in average, and now we're down to about 41. And this is the interesting part. We are getting younger, everybody else is getting older. <laughs> We are getting younger in St. Petersburg. Why? Because the young people want to live here. Well, guess what? Those young people are who the companies need to hire. So when they're looking to locate or expand, they need to know that they got a worker base, and we have it in St. Pete. Again, we're getting younger. Pinellas County, the MSA, Florida, USA, all getting older. So I'm going to go through this quickly. I show this slide every year, a uh, series of slides, because I love it. Uh, this is the hourglass shape here. We're old at the top, a lot of old people back in the 70s. The old people are great, don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm not bashing. <laughs> then in the 90s, uh, we moved a little bit. We got a little wider in the middle, which is where the younger people are a little smaller at the top, and then today you can see that we're no lo longer an hourglass, we're a beer mug. <laughs> and the beer mug, look at this, I mean, we're even a little wider here, and again, this gets to the point of having a labor market here in St. Petersburg. Okay, this is maybe one of the most important slides that you'll see today, and it just confirms everything that I just said. Um, here you can see that our share of the population ages 20 to 39 has gone from 26% back in 2014 to 29.3% in 2018. You can see in the uh, lower half of the right-hand column that we are at the top of our peers in terms of the growth in this age group. Now, if you look at our peer cities, which is the top part, we still have some ways to go. We're catching them, but we're not there yet. Orlando, Durham, they're usually at the top, uh, but we're, we're making progress, substantial progress. And a lot of that has to do with the placemaking that we do. Like when, we're going to talk about the peer later, but when we did the peer, we met for two years with the young professionals, the new millennials. It took me a, a little while to understand exactly what they were saying, <laughs> but once we figured it out, we wrote it down. 
Okay, another major economic development indicator is educational attainment. How, I'm not saying that that makes us smarter, but what kind of level of degree making do we have in our community that companies again look at? So hats go off to our high school, uh, our education system and our high school attainment rates related to uh, degrees is the highest amongst our peers. It's highest amongst our peers. And I believe they just announced that that increased from last year to this year. This may be the more important. The next two slides, uh, the educational attainment rate for the bachelor degree, uh, we have some movement there. Now it makes sense because we've got younger people moving here for jobs. And we've got some job growth as I'll point out in a minute. But for bachelor deg degrees, year over year, last year to this year, we went from 34% to 36.6%. That is why companies like L3 take 60,000 square feet downtown without any incentives. And that is why Dynasty moves from New York City to downtown St. Pete without any incentives. And it gets even better if you look at our age group between 24 and 34. We went from 38% to 42%, a 4% increase in bachelor degrees amongst those people. That's a talent pool. And then lastly, uh, there was a small increase from 12% to 12.6% in graduate degrees. And finally, we want to talk about medium household income. Uh, we look at that every year. Um, one of the big goals of the Grow Smarter strategy, which we're going to talk about later on, was about increasing our income in the city. We love hospitality. We love hospitality employment. It's a major focus of ours, and it should be. But we said to ourselves, are there other industry clusters that we need to focus on to grow that income? So the medium household income over the last four years has grown 26%. You can see that we're at the high end of our peers, and if you break that down by year, it's 5.2% a year increase in St. Petersburg in, term of, in terms of the medium household income. And if you look at our peers, some of our peers, Tampa is at 3.8%, the MSA is at 3.4%, and the United States was at 3%. So we are above those uh, peers. And in our business, I, we, we, one thing I want to explain is that we do have to go high level in this presentation just because of time. We don't have time to get into uh, how some of these numbers break down across categories. But we like to do some of that because uh, uh, prosperity for all is very important to the mayor and the deputy mayor and our administration. And so we have to look at, well, is, is everybody doing well? Um, and in this case, we looked at African-American medium household income growth, and you can see that the growth there is substantial, 72% gain in that growth. But I will point out that the um, average medium household income for African-Americans is still $10,000 less than for whites. So we still have a gap, and we have work to do. Poverty rate, you can see that we're at the, uh, in the best position of all our peers uh, over the last uh, year. We went from a poverty rate last year of 13.9% to a poverty rate this year of 12.3%. The poverty rate change has been substantial. Uh, over the past five years, the poverty rate has decreased by the tune of 31%. That is doing something right. The African American poverty rate change has been substantial. Uh, in the last five years, it has decreased 46%. One of the things that uh, the city council, the mayor, the administration, everybody in the city has worked hard at is the South St. Petersburg CRA, uh, the TIF district. We all know that downtown was a TIF district, and look what happened to it. 
And so a couple years back, the city made a conscientious effort to do the same thing with South St. Pete. And I just wanted to indicate here in this slide um, that we have worked hard over the years, the last three years, we have invested in 94 companies in that particular area uh, to the tune of 1.8 million uh, for the purpose of inclusive prosperity. It's about investing in people, not necessarily buildings. But I should stop talking about that because there's two people here that should start to talk about that and talk about it much better than I can. I want to introduce Reverend Lewis Murphy, who is the pastor of the Mount Zion Progressive Missionary Baptist Church and Albert Lee, Tampa Bay Black Business Investment Corporation. They have put together, along with th that community in South St. Petersburg, an incredible plan that if we follow it, uh, we'll have tremendous returns. But I'll let them take it from here. Good afternoon. Thank you so very much, Alan, for that introduction. We, it has uh, been kind of a long road, if you will. We, we didn't just start with uh, one community. The history of uh, one, community go, one community goes back to the 2020 plan, actually goes back to agenda 2010. And every uh, decade, we uh, re regrouped and, saw and, and, and assessed what, where we were and what we need to do to keep moving forward. Going back to Agenda 2010, again, our whole effort was to uh, increase the quality of living in, in South St. Petersburg the, um, uh, through poverty reduction, job creation, uh, entrepreneurship. We, uh, after 2010, uh, 2010, when we started, we uh, developed uh, the 2020 plan, which you all know about now, and partnered with the city of St. Pete, uh, continued to, to uh, uh, affect those numbers uh, to reduce poverty. And it has been absolutely exciting to see so many uh, of the other uh, community organizations come together to affect that effort. Uh, our partnership with the Urban League, with the uh, Community and Collective Empowerment Group of Tampa Bay, uh, the New Deal, so many organizations that have come together realizing that we need to do this in a collective way to make sure that we're impacting uh, our community. We uh, had an opportunity to uh, travel to uh, North Carolina with the chamber and saw what they were doing there. Took a group of kids, about well, young folks, uh, who we call our emerging leaders. Took about 20 or uh, 30 of those uh, young folks to uh, North Carolina, and they got so excited and innovated that they began to do their own uh, thing. So it's been a real uh, pleasure working in our community with the organizations that are actually making these numbers what they are today, reducing poverty in our community, creating jobs, making sure that people have livable wages, and the effort is, is ongoing. So very grateful for all that uh, everyone is doing, and at this time I'll turn it over to Alan. Well, thank you very much, Pastor Murphy, and I want to thank the uh, city of St. Petersburg, the mayor, his team, Urban Affairs Director, just a great, great team, and what they've been able to allow us to do. Um, believe it or not, we have just a small uh, role in what's been going on. We were very fortunate to be able to, uh, I guess, uh, jump in and help a little bit. So some of the things that we're going to be, uh, I guess, emphasizing over the next several years, as Pastor Murphy said, you know, we were asked to speak a bit on, you know, how do we continue this growth, right? So. There's a group uh, of, of, that has transitioned from 2020 to one community to specifically deal with these issues. One of the things that, that has to happen, if you want change, you have to have concerted effort to make that happen. These things didn't just happen. Uh, uh, they, they were a focused effort of a lot of people. And like I said, we're a very, very small part of that. But the One Community Plan uh, is an entrepreneurship in real estate investment development plan that will help focus some of the things that people want to see in the south side community happen and again you have to have focused effort to do that there are four current initiatives uh, that you will see coming about over the next uh, few months and years 
there will be, uh, there's a proposed 2.5 to 3 acre development uh, in the former uh, development called Commerce Park over on 22nd Street South. Uh, there's a planned housing development program that is uh, in process now that will add additional commercial space over there for businesses to relocate over in that corridor. Additionally, you'll see uh, a emerging leaders program that the 2020 plan has put together in one community to help grow individuals from that community who want to return and be leaders in that community. That is important that you're raising up the next generation of people that will help change and continue that change. Uh, additionally, the uh, one peer shared space concept at the new peer marketplace. And, and at that facility, we will house six African American businesses and give them an opportunity to participate in the commerce that's going on uh, at the new pier. And the new inclusive St. Pete Minority Business uh, Enterprise Accelerator for six figure African American owned companies. The Tampa Bay Black Business Investment Corporation uh, started our cap program some uh, four years ago uh, with the help for Foundation for Health in St. Petersburg, along with the uh, city of St. Petersburg. And that was able to help a lot with getting some of the smaller businesses up and running. But there needs to be more of a focused effort on business and want to have more opportunities to do business with the uh, city. And so this program will be designed to help accelerate that. So I want you to just think in terms of how do you get here as a whole and as a community. And again, it takes focused effort. Uh, you look at those numbers and they didn't just happen by happenstance. If you go back and look at some of the targets of the 2020 plan, that was the focus. That was the goal. But you've got to have a set of people and a group of people who are serious about allowing that to happen. Doesn't always look pretty, okay? Sometimes there are tough <clears throat> discussions in communities, but at the end of the day, what ends up happening, if everybody can keep a cohesive focus, you can make these things happen, especially when you have a cohesive working relationship with the corporate community, uh, the neighborhood communities, and the city overall. So with that, uh, I wanna thank you all for the opportunity. Alan, thank you very much. Okay, so we will move right into revenue generators, which is another major area that economic development people keep their eyes on, and so do city budget folks. Total construction value and permit issued. Um, we have had a, a steady increase every year. We've broken records every year, um, and we did it again last year. Uh, we had a 12% increase in our construction value. These, these are projects that are in for permitting that have a value in terms of the, uh, how much they cost to develop. So last year, in 2019, we had $782 million. The year before, we had $695 million. So I know that I'm looking at Liz Abernathy and, and uh, Don Tyre, Chief DeMonte, um, the systems that they have in place are not easy. Uh, remarkable work by a lot of people. It takes a lot of coordination to do that. My hat goes off to them. We had an increase in permits last year of 2% from 34,382. That's right, permits. That's permits. For people to be able to do work, uh, we went from 34,382 to 34,998 uh, permits. And I'm told that we're on course to break records again this year. No pressure. No pressure on that. Um, zoning reviews were up 15%. Zoning cases were up 6%. Zoning inspections were up 23%. And our time to review zoning plans was reduced by 60%. If you want to give a round of applause. You can. And this just shows, I'll be very brief on this one, this just shows the breakdown of where those numbers are coming from. And you can see that the biggest number is new residential, and that's mainly multifamily development. But then we wanted to know, well, okay, what's the difference uh, between these construction values between downtown and the rest of the city? Because everybody thinks everything's happening in downtown, right? Well, as you can see here, that's not the case. Um, in residential, uh, downtown represented about 40%, uh, but about 60% came 
of that value was outside of downtown. Commercial, uh, even more of a disparity. 12.6% uh, of commercial development happened in downtown last year. 87.4% happened outside of downtown. Construction values, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, downtown dwelling units. Uh, we keep our eye on this. Um, in 2015, we had 5,500 units downtown. Uh, five years later, we have uh, 11,000 units downtown. Um, so that's a lot more spending in downtown, a lot more reasons for restaurants downtown, and a lot more reasons for the new millennials to work there. And I see Dynasty shaking their head. <laughs> Taxable values, uh, we represent 25% of the county's property value. Um, so we like to remind the county about that every now and then. <laughs> and that's increasing. Uh, the total value property, the taxable values in St. Pete is uh, $20.8 trillion. And the taxable growth value over the last five years has been steady from 8.4% increase in 2015 uh, to a 9.7% increase last year in taxable values. Uh, almost a 10% uh, increase, uh, almost a 10% growth rate increase uh, was represented last year. Uh, and I, I remind my colleagues all the time, this is what pays uh, for our infrastructure improvements, uh, for affordable housing, Rob, <laughs> and uh, keeps our tax rates low. Taxable values in, in South St. Pete, uh, same thing. Uh, in that CRA district that we just talked about, the taxable values went up 12%. That means wealth generation for people who are living there. Um, so if you look, if you, that, if you look at, you kind of line that up with uh, the increases in the um, in the uh, decrease in, in the poverty rate uh, in this area of town and the increase in medium household income in this part of town, it lines up. You can, you can start to see a relationship there. Pinellas County tourism uh, is a very, this again, getting back to the point about hospitality and tourism, very important part of this. It drives a lot of revenue. Why? Because people from outside of our community come here and spend money. And yes, they go to museums uh, as well as other venues. So you can just see the staggering amount of numbers here. We have 15.5 million visitors uh, that come to Pinellas County every year, or at least in, in 2019, for a total economic impact of $8.3 trillion. But we always have to be thinking about the future uh, when it comes to this. We can never stay still in economic development. We can never stay still. Always have to keep moving, always have to keep investing, always have to keep adding value um, which is why we don't stay in our chairs very long. Um, and so part of this is Tropicana Field, which is a tremendous opportunity. As the mayor calls it, a generational opportunity. Uh, once in a lifetime opportunity, 86 acres sitting right in the middle of our city, connecting a lot of uh, our, our neighborhoods. The city has been busy. We have not been uh, you know, throwing this up in neon signs, but we've been very busy. The mayor and deputy mayor have us working behind the scenes to make sure that we're ready when that project goes. Uh, we've done two conceptual plans, one with the stadium and without. Uh, we've done, a, uh, we've done a, a study and a plan on smart city sustainability and healthy community development, how to do that right on that site. Uh, downtown mobility study, that's happening right now. We're looking at transportation issues in and around that site. Uh, possibly looking at some, doing something different with 175, which is a barrier to South St. Pete right now. We've talked about community benefit agreement uh, and the elements of that to make sure that our residents benefit from this first and foremost. Uh, the mayor has struck a deal with the county to make sure that we have $75 million set aside for investing in that site when the time comes. And that would be in infrastructure improvements. And then lastly, uh, Duke Energy, who is our sponsor of this event, 
But even better than that, um, they came to us with an idea uh, to engage an outside firm to look at the trap site to measure uh, its utility infrastructure to see if we're ready to go and to look at how businesses would look at the site. And so we are very fortunate today to have some very important people that, again, look at this from a third party perspective. Chris <coughs> Schwinden, uh, Senior Vice President of the Site Selection Group, and Beth Land, Vice President, Site Selection Group, if they could come up. And they're going to talk to you about their findings. They've been looking at this for several months. And they're going to talk to you about what they think about the trap. All right. Very excited to be here today. Again, I'm Beth Land. We are with Site Selection Group. My colleague Chris Schwinden is here. Um, we're here on behalf of Duke Energy. They have hired us and engaged us to take a look at the property, the Tropicana site. And we are really excited. I think one of the things that's nice about today is that we have a very positive message to share. Sometimes we go to communities and it's not so positive. Um, so today, we're going to take a look from a third party perspective, from our perspective, of a site selection consultant. Every day we help companies choose where to locate. And so with that lens, we're gonna take a look at this property. So again, Duke Energy has engaged us. This program that this property was put into, it's called the Site Readiness Program. It's to identify, um, and improve, assess properties that were within their territory and kind of assess them for their readiness for what, they, what communities can do to improve the marketability um, and really make it attractive for companies that are looking to locate. So um, obviously this helps economic development groups have somebody with a briefcase come into town that are constantly looking at properties from a, from a third party perspective and, and offer that lens. So we're excited to be here today and appreciate Duke Energy for participating. And we also want to thank the city um, for participating. This is a pretty rigorous process. Uh, we didn't get to this summary of information easily. Uh, it's a lot of information that, that goes into it. I've actually participated from the community side at the beginning of my career. Uh, I wouldn't call it fun. Um, it's 200 question questionnaire, big RFI. It's much like it would be if a, a company was choosing to come here. So a lot of information and gather, was gathered and that itself is valuable for this property. So let me tell you a little bit about Site Selection Group. We are based in Dallas. That's where my colleague Chris uh, flew here from. I'm in Greenville, South Carolina. We've got folks in Austin, New York, what we do, and maybe after today, lovely day in St. Petersburg, I'm thinking SSG St. Petersburg sounds pretty good. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that sounds pretty good. So um, what we do day in, day out is help companies choose where to locate, looking at everything from you know, their labor profiles and the, where to pull the best labor draw from, real estate, tax incentives, tax structure, operating costs, all those things that go into a location strategy decision, customer supplier base, um, looking at you know, education partners. We help assess properties all across, and we do work primarily in the lower 48, but we've had companies this year look in Mexico and Canada as well. So we feel like we've got our finger on the pulse for what really drives these decisions, and based on that experience, we want to kind of lean towards this property and share some of our thoughts create a strategic and action item plan so that the community can kind of work towards that with the Tropicana site. With this particular, one more second, sorry about that. We're gonna look at three different things, kind of a physical site, a technical analysis, that's kind of where my um, background lies. Then we've got a data guru over here. He's gonna work more on the workforce and target industry side. We're gonna layer all three of these kind of different aspects together to get a really a holistic look at what the potential is at the property. So let's just pause here looking at the site, and everybody knows this site, the mayor has called it generational. We have up, and up in the uh, border there an extraordinary opportunity, and it is, it truly is. We look at hundreds of sites every single year from Farmer Joe's cornfield to some really rough redevelopment sites and so forth, and we can say without question that this is, uh, what's it the best? is probably one of the best sites you, you can imagine. That's for a few reasons. One is just the site itself from an infrastructure perspective, from a topography, from ownership is a huge 
huge issue. It's an unbelievable site. From a macroeconomic perspective, it's sitting in a really business friendly state in a really fast growing market, an attractive place for business. From a micro perspective, it's literally between Central Business District, as I jokingly say, where all the hipsters are hanging out, neighborhoods, uh, redevelopment. It's just an unbelievable, unique opportunity. But what's most important on this is that it, it can change the dynamic of this city and this community uh, from a workforce perspective, from a demographic perspective, from a community development perspective. It's one of those very rare instances where we don't have to take all those factors as a given, whether it's workforce or what have you. These are things that development, redevelopment of this site can influence for the next 10, 20, 50 years. It's an unbelievable opportunity. The only other thing I'll say about um, you know our perspective that we provide, and I was so glad to see Alan's slide, it said all the different initiatives that are going on between mobility study, um, there's been a great outreach effort for the community. All these different perspectives have been layered together. And so what Chris and I are here to do today is to offer one very specific perspective. And we think that it's only one perspective within a broad, broad range of ideas, concerns, suggestions that need to be considered. So whenever we kind of put together these kind of key um, you know, development strategy tips, this is kind of what comes to mind. Number one, this is gonna be a complex project. And so the timing and the planning of this is so critical for it to be done right. Because ultimately, I think, you know, there's a lot of different objectives here. We want to get really good, high-paying jobs. We want good capital investment. We want the right mix of housing and, and mixed use and commercial and office space. Um, you know, there's even opportunities for some really higher end uses like life sciences. So we want to make sure that we don't just let this develop as it would. Because the, the city and the county have control of this property, and that is particularly rare, um, you know, for a, for a property that's this much in the center of the community, uh, we want to make sure that you have a good idea of what the highest and best uses of the property and be an advocate for the community to make sure it's developed in the right way. One of the ways you do this is by finding the right development partner, um, somebody that can help drive the RFP process and make sure that your goals align with your developer's goals because those can often be different, right? Finally, I, you know, we think it's really critical to go ahead and start now. Another really unique part of this project is that you've got, you've got a little bit of time before the, the Ray lease, the, the, the Tropicana Ray lease runs out. So that's unique in of itself that we have some time to plan, but it is such a complex project that we think it's critical to go ahead and start now. So the timing and the planning is gonna be very critical. One more thing I'll say is the communities that we see the most successful are those that retain some flexibility in their vision. Our, our clients have visions for their products, visions for their services. They also have to re remain flexible as the market changes. So although you may have a master development plan, be sure to provide support to your economic development group so that long term you can have the best plan, not the first one that you landed on. So with all that said about development of the physical site, for the highest and best uses of, of sites like this, it's all about workforce right now, um, especially for high profile professional services. Again, as we said, this is a site that can move the needle on that workforce value proposition from a demographic, from an occupational stage. But that being said, we need to take that account when we do this analysis and the community needs to take that into account on how they identify the highest and best uses. So with that being said, Let's jump to the, the, the workforce summary slide. A lot of information up here. This captures, if we're putting on our site selectors hat, how we evaluate communities um, to locate a project. I'll make a couple key points. One, we always do this in a comparative framework. We're benchmarking this site and this particular labor shed, 40 minutes around it, against where we would locate other high profile projects. Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham, Nashville, uh, Phoenix. So we're, comp we're comparing this against the best of the best. So when you break it up into three big categories, do you have people, demographics, do you have the right occupational dynamics, the supply and demand of key skill sets, and then the right educational partners. We've talked a little bit about the, obviously the favorable population growth here. That's something that you see in the Sun Belt, see in this market, and is really, really favorable. You might be a little surprised there to see what we what Alan was talking about there a moment ago, what we see as, as challenges to attract those really high profile projects. 
folks are still gonna look at the data around the site and say this looks a little bit older than a Raleigh Durham or a Charlotte or a Nashville or an Austin or what have you. So age profile is obviously a critical constraint as is educational attainment levels for really high end projects that are gonna be highest and best use. From an occupational dynamics perspective, there's a lot of really attractive kind of features of this market when what types of workers are here. Obviously for business occupations, for what we call moderate skill IT, for healthcare and so forth. But again, if this site is gonna be used for highest and best use, how, does it, how is it going to look compared to some of those other markets where you're looking for really high skill IT workers, really high skill engineering and life science workers and so forth? That's gonna be the question on development of this site. And then finally, from an educational partner perspective, you know, there's a, universities like USF and USFSP are growing like crazy. And you look at the data on how many completions are coming out of those institutions, how much R&D spend is coming out. But the challenge is gonna be, what's the value proposition and how integrated are institutions of higher education with development of the site? What is a company gonna say, I wanna partner with USF or USFSP at this site, rather than partnering with an NC State in Durham or a Georgia Tech in Atlanta or an Arizona State in Phoenix? There's a lot of competition on the higher ed side and that's gonna be the crux of making sure that you get the most attractive industries on, on this site. We put this into three big buckets here around what are the best uses for this. One is professional services, obviously given Given the types of occupation, types of industries in this market, that's a no-brainer. It's gonna be a little bit harder to get the really high-end information technology jobs and, and, and companies to come here, but are already starting to see that. And then finally, on the life sciences side and research development and really high-end jobs that are gonna move the needle on median income and so forth and further diversify the economy. We think these are all opportunities, but they're all completely not completely contingent, but really contingent on the end of having really strong partnerships with higher education and education more generally. Finally here, before we just get to a couple maps that we'll, we'll look over, is just some broad recommendations that we're making. I'll cover two of these. First one is on the housing side. We've talked a little bit about housing, and obviously this is gonna be a mixed use site for housing, retail, cultural amenities, uh, primary industry, and so forth. Housing's a challenge in every attractive market in terms of its cost and availability. So how can housing that's affordable to the types of workers, the types of millennials and Gen Z workers who are gonna wanna live and play where they work, how is that gonna be integrated into the overall plan? On higher education, we're, we've talked about this a little bit, higher education is gonna have to play a really big role, probably an even bigger role than we thought when we first started this project. That's gonna be critical to get those high-end jobs and get those high-end industries to come here to St. Pete. Very good, and just to tackle some of the infrastructure, one of the things before you dive into this big redevelopment project, you wanna make sure does the infrastructure support a redevelopment. This program did a great job of organizing and figuring out what infrastructure is, is in place, and we have a very happy message to share that there is a ton of robust infrastructure in place to support a very different, diverse, flexible types of uses at this property, which is great to know. So this program has kind of helped organize that. Uh, the, the, the folks at the city will be very well prepared to respond to prospect requests for information after this. We've also identified a few of the, you know, kind of items they may want to address from an infrastructure and from a site development standpoint. So we've highlighted those as well. Um, so we're excited where all the information end up and kind of from a, a broader strategy and administration perspective, Again, as we said, make sure that you just take that long-term vision um, and don't sacrifice the quality. This is a phenomenal site, and we would hate to see it squandered on a kind of you know lower lower end use. So you know you've got a gym here. Take that long-term perspective, and uh, we really suggest incorporating that third-party partner during the RFP process just to kind of help you navigate, leverage responses, and come up with ideas you may not have considered otherwise. So now we get to the fun part, um, and I really want to give credit where credit is due. We've got Nicole and Clark here from Ardura. They put together these maps, and so it kind of takes a lot of the information that we gather and puts it into fun cartoons, um, and really provides a good map book for the city to respond. Professional, 
maps that prospects need because sometimes, although they have visions for their products, they don't have visions for properties. So this kind of just helps give us an idea of, of what is kind of the surrounding context of the map. Um, obviously, you know, incredible, not only access, but visibility from I-175 I and I-275. This particular lot over here, as you'll see, there's kind of a, a larger contiguous lot in the middle. There's also some out parcels um, that are available to develop and maybe could be developed in phases. So we've tried to put together a map here that captures some of the existing conditions and we'll go on to the next. This is a hydrology map looking at some of the water features. Uh, Booker Creek runs on site, and we're not gonna go through all the maps in detail, but one thing I wanted to highlight is sometimes communities can really leverage some existing natural features to kind of create um, you know, a, a nice feature um, from a, a livability and from a cultural experience at the property for employees. Uh, employers, it's so hard to recruit good talent these days, and if you can incorporate walking trails, water features, anything that makes them feel like they're not trapped at a cubicle all day, that's a good thing. Yeah. So that's something that we definitely want to highlight. Um, it's not easy to move, and so it needs to be incorporated in that master development plan. So we've got that map. We can keep, keep going. This is just a neighborhood map, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. What we wanted to communicate is wow what a diverse um you know group of neighborhoods that you have to draw from and it's great from a workforce perspective to have such unique kind of a just that hipster culture that you've got to have in order to recruit the younger talent and so that's that's really incredible um, and then kind of in the same vein we have a walking map here that conveys how quickly you can get from one spot to the next and let me tell you between that neighborhood district slide and this walkability slide there are communities out there that would kill for what y'all have here. The energy, the environment, the growth, this is very exciting. And so we're happy to put, to put these maps together and hopefully they're good tools in your tool belt as you recruit new industry and new employers to this, this property. Any closing thoughts? We'll be here for cocktail hour if yeah. you want to uh, chat a little bit. And so, uh, and talk a bit about demographics. That's yeah, a favorite. A tremendous opportunity, and we really appreciate the city's support. You, you guys just have just an awesome opportunity here. Okay, so I was sit, standing over here, and I saw Mike Jeffries, who runs our Park and Recreation Department, getting very excited about the site. Mike, this is not going to be a park. <laughs> not all of it. Not all. Some of it, but not all. Of it. Uh, okay, real estate. Uh, let, let's uh, let's get into uh, another major important area that economic development folks keep an eye on on a regular basis is what is happening with our real estate. We'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, the bottom line is that you want to see. You want to see vacancy rates decreasing um, across the board. That means the more people are in your buildings. And that usually drives up the cost of rental rates, which allows developers to build more uh, because the price point works. And if any of you that were here last year heard a roundtable discussion about that very thing. So for the most part, that is what's happening in St. Petersburg. Our vacancy rates are decreasing and our price point is increasing, not a lot, but slightly. This is Class A office space overall, which is the highest end of office space. Downtown Class A office space, again, the trend's going in the right direction. Less uh, uh, um, price point increasing over the last five years, vacancy rate decreasing substantially. And you can see the difference, 22% vacancy rate uh, to what is now about 9%. Uh, in downtown Class B and Class C space, which is uh, uh, medium and lower end uh, office space, uh, interesting there because price points are going up considerably and vacancy rates are going down considerably. Why? Because these properties are being targeted by developers to redevelop. Downtown tenant mix, we keep our eye on uh, who are the tenants in downtown. Substantial change that this slide shows from 1986 to 2019. It used to be 
a bunch of uh, banks and legal law firms. Um, but you can see now that it's more creative companies and tech companies that are moving, that have moved downtown and continue to move downtown. Uh, but it's not all about downtown, as we know. Uh, there's actually some office space. Uh, most of our office space, or the majority of our office space, is in the Gateway District. And Raymond James has a lot to do with this slide. Raymond James has created about 1,000 new jobs over the last year or two. And uh, vacancy rates uh, are down in the Gateway District, and the price point has held steady. Class B and Class C office space, similar trends. Uh, those are being targeted for redevelopment. A lot of that space is getting turned over. Prices are increasing. Vacancy rates are decreasing. And the Skyway Marina District, um, well, who thought that was going to happen, right? I mean, five years ago, we were talking about hopefully, maybe, we can get somebody interested. Um, well. Uh, that has taken off. A lot of redevelopment is occurring there now, and the vacancy rate is way down, 1.9%, uh, because those buildings are being redeveloped, and the price points are going up. But the price points are not going up as high as downtown. In terms of retail, uh, vacancy rate uh, is, is down uh, as well. Uh, for the city, across the city, and then in our neighborhood commercial districts, same. Uh, and then, of course, in the Skyway Marina District, there is virtually no space left. And this is why we've got three major projects under construction in the Skyway Marina District. Uh, it is going to produce 850 new housing units. Uh, so this is part of a lower price point. A lot of times what happens is when a downtown catches on fire and gets hot, uh, prices go up and developers start moving out further. Um, so this is housing uh, that's affordable, as the mayor would say. It's not affordable housing, but it's housing that's affordable. The price point is lower than downtown, and therefore it is an option to keep more people in our city, uh, young people working in our, in our city. The Grow Smarter Opportunity Sites I give a report to the council on a regular basis. We keep track of mainly publicly owned sites, but also privately owned sites that we think are important and key to our redevelopment and our ability to grow jobs in our city. Uh, you can see that uh, the left-hand column, uh, those are sites that are all progressing, all moving forward uh, in some shape, uh, shape or form. And then we've got a couple of sites that uh, are on hold uh, that we're still hoping will move this year, but haven't yet. Two sites that I just want to call attention to, the Innovation District site, uh, that's the county project. Uh, and that is the Innovation Center project. I think Tanya is here. I saw her earlier. She had a great event last night. And um, um, that's going to be about 40,000 square feet. Uh, basically, entrepreneurs, startup companies, ability to, to grow uh, more of business development from within. Uh, and then the other one is the Deuces Rising, uh, which was announced by the mayor recently and the deputy mayor, and the whole concept of uh, re-envisioning uh, what was called Commerce Park. One of the goals that we've had over the last several years is to create more office space. Uh, so that uh, businesses that want to locate here are running out of office space, quite honestly. So we put a high premium on creating more office space so that in the future, as the dynasties and the other companies move to St. Pete, we've got a place to put them. Red Apple is going to have 23,000 square feet of new space. The Nunzio project, which we just concluded, the council approved uh, not too long ago, uh, is going to have 40,000 square feet of new office space minimum. Uh, the old police department site, uh, we just approved, the, mayor, the council approved a term sheet. We're going to go back with a development agreement soon. Uh, that'll create 100,000 square feet of new office space. And that'll be spec office space, by the way. Uh, that's not pre-leased. Um, so that is 
definitely new to the marketplace. And then lastly, very proud, again, the council approved uh, an agreement with UPC. They're going to do a regional headquarters building it here in, in downtown St. Pete, 150,000 square feet, and we hope that they'll be under construction uh, this year on that project. And I was asked, um, well, what's the demand for all these different types of development moving forward? Great question. That's why we're doing 2050 in part. And we uh, did a study, it's not done yet, but it's, but it's gonna be done soon, that shows, and I, and I draw your attention to the bottom section of this, because it's on an annualized basis. So over the next 30 years, on an annual basis, we are projecting that we're going to need somewhere between 78,000 square feet and 135,000 square feet of office space. That's every year. So over 10 years, that's 1.3 million square feet. So that shows you that it's not only people like me who talk about what's the, all the great thing that's happening, but the market study is bearing this out as well. Residential, we're going to need 1,000 to 1,500 units. Uh, uh, affordable would be included in that. Workforce would be included in that. Retail, uh, somewhere between 38,000 square feet and 63,000 square feet. And hotel, this on an annual basis, we're going to need 110 to 185 new rooms. Every, every year uh, we talk about um, what projects create the most taxable value. It's interesting because if you look at taxable value uh, just by itself, um, three of the top four are commercial projects in St. Petersburg that derive the most tax return. But if you look, and this gets to uh, density, if you look, if you break that down, taxable value per acre, then it is five of the top tax generating projects are multifamily. And most of those are in downtown. Our 20 top private sector employers, uh, we always want to keep an eye on this. What's interesting here is where they're located. Um, most of them are in the Gateway District. Um, a few of them are in downtown. We've got one in Skyway Marina and one in Tyrone. Uh, the price of homes is going up. We know that. We've been talking about that. Uh, but if you look at this slide, what's interesting about it is that compared to our peers, um, it's not going up as, as, as high as many of our peer cities to the point that affordable housing is an issue across the country. Uh, but it is an issue, and it has increased about 5% uh, from 2018 to 2019. It also impacts, not only does it impact, you know, the low wage earner, but it also impacts the average wage owner, which is why workforce housing is discussed quite a bit. And of course, we have the mayor and the deputy mayor and the city council they have announced an affordable plan, housing plan for all from all, a uh, 10 year plan to increase affordability in our housing units. Uh, for us, it is tied to business development and it will be part of the TROP development in the future, as we've discussed. And then, from a real estate standpoint, I'm not, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Everybody knows we got a small little project going on with the pier, <laughs> we're making progress. Um, it is coming together wonderfully. Uh, it is going to be a national story. Uh, it is going to create a lot of energy and it's going to connect our most valuable piece of land, which is surrounded by water, to our downtown. Uh, it will become one and the same. Uh, and a lot of people, both regionally and internationally, are going to want to come and visit this site. Um, that leads to our Dave Goodwin Award. Uh, last year, uh, we gave our first award out. Uh, Dave Goodwin retired. We decided to create an award after the work that Dave has done in his career, or did in his career, uh, still doing a little bit still. Um, 
And it's all about uh, somebody that in our community who really brings both skill sets of public and private and combines those in a way to impact our city and change the scale and scope of our city. So I'm going to ask Dave to come up and present that award. Well, so far, what a great uh, presentation from Al and his team in the mayor's office. The news is incredible. And uh, now that I'm not in the city any longer, it's gotten better. So I'm not sure that I'm but I'm really happy to be here today uh, to recognize one of the people. You know, got a lot of numbers and stuff. Re recognize one of the people that you may not know who's been instrumental in, in a lot of big projects in this community and, and other places too. And we're going to hear a little bit about that. So let me just talk about it. Chuck DeBlon. Woo! <laughs> Uh, Skanks at USA, Senior Vice President and Account Manager. Nearly five decades of experience in the construction industry. Chuck Jablon is a seasoned professional who has been with Skanks for the uh, last 16 years. As Senior Vice President and Account Manager, Chuck is part of Skanks' Florida Senior Leadership Team as an involved, and is involved in helping guide the firm's construction projects and pursuit across Florida, primarily in the St. Pete, Tampa area. He builds client relationships and strengthens operational performance. During his time in the company, Chuck has been recognized as one of engineering news records, top 25 newsmakers. So if you know about ENR, you know that's a pretty big deal. As a lifelong resident of St. Pete, he is a lifelong resident of St. Pete, Chuck is proud to have worked on numerous transformative projects that continue to shape the present and future of Greater St. Petersburg. And when this was written, it said Greater Tampa Bay. Chris Steinart, you know, we don't talk to you. I don't, I don't that you know. Through his vision, work, ethic, and enthusiasm, Chuck has helped to transform the very community he grew up in with his involvement in impactful projects that span healthcare, education, parks, public spaces, and cultural centers. Chuck started his career in St. Petersburg in 1971 on the private project side doing condos and custom houses including the uh, house for the Zorro actor John Carroll. We all know who that is, right? <laughs> Didn't think you would. But that was a big deal back in 1971. Uh, he's also done assisted living facilities and major office projects. Starting with a great experience working with Ken Welch Sr., we do know who that is, on the Pinellas County Adult Vocational Education Institute project, Chuck got into doing more public and not-for-profit projects. At McDill, he constructed the Bay Shopping Mall. At USF, he constructed the Campus Administration Building, including a bridge to the new Nelson Point Library and a new physical plant. At USF Tampa, he constructed the Special Events Center, the Student Health Center, and the Media Center. But though not a local project, this one is special. Chuck went to Alabama to do the renovations and upgrades of 100-plus-year-old historic buildings on the campus of Tuskegee University, a National Register Historic Site. As you can imagine, that was quite an experience, and you know, you know it takes a special person to get through a project like that. It is obviously going to be very important, very delicate, with a lot of eyes on it. Other projects on his resume include Pinellas County Jail and Manatee and Marion County School District school projects, projects at Florida State College, Florida State University, and even at the University of Florida. He also did the uh, multiple building, $106 million Florida Polytechnic University project. You all know what that is? All right, so Chuck was responsible for getting that thing built, and I can imagine that was complicated. He led the construction of the signature architectural piece for the university, the iconic Innovation Science and Technology Building, the IST building. Getting closer to home in Tampa, two major public pro projects I want to mention, the city's $44.9 million Tampa Museum of Art and Curtis Hickson Waterfront Park, and the $35 million renovation and expansion of Julian B. Lane Waterfront Park. Great projects, and of course, that's Tampa trying to catch up with St. Pete. Yeah. <laughs> Chuck, all right, good projects. <laughs> Chuck did the St. Nicholas National Shrine at the World Trade Center at Ground Zero. The structure is complete and waiting on further funding. You may not have known that in New York City at Ground Zero. 
And finally, J, uh, uh, check is, uh, is doing the JML headquarters project up on Roosevelt Boulevard. Uh, one of the most amazing economic development deals this city has ever done and being executed brilliantly by Jay and his team. So for all that amazing work they did is preparing Chuck to come back to his hometown and his two most transformative projects. First, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital Research and Education Building. The 100 million, 230,000 square foot new research and education building in the St. Pete includes a 30,000 square foot of research and laboratory space, 30,000 square feet of education simulation space, including an auditorium with 400 seats, 20,000 square foot collaboration space, 50,000 square feet of office administration space, and a bio repository. And lastly, and Alan mentioned earlier, Chuck's little project down on the waterfront. Chuck is leading the construction of the massively complex $92 million Pier District project. The project includes the reconstructed Pier Bridge, Pier Head, and Pier Approach area. The signature 26-acre downtown waterfront project will provide interactive experience all along its 3,065-foot length and improvements to the area between the reconstructed pier and the downtown core of St. Petersburg. The Pier District project will feature restaurants, Discovery Center with white classrooms, a children's playground, a pavilion, a reconstructed beach, public art installations, a public market, and more. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah. Chuck thinks of the project as both a gift to the city and a tribute to McKenna, his recently lost 34-year life partner, with whom he had hoped, with whom he had looked forward to spending time at the Pure District. To his credit, Chuck is most proud of his people. The teams he has assembled to create these many assets, he is fiercely supportive and protective of them and has maintained long-term mentoring relationships with people in the business for many years. When he's not busy in the construction site, Chuck is heavily involved in giving back to the community and personally has taken the lead in organizing and holding various charitable events, which have helped raise over $2.5 million locally in the Tampa Bay region. Chuck's involvement with organizations range from the Ronald McDonald House and American Heart Association, to the Moffitt Cancer Center, and the Leadership and Innovation Forum of Tampa Lift, powered by the University of South Florida Health. Chuck is also a member of the St. Pete Yacht Club, and is the Del Sol. So it is my distinct pleasure to present this year's Excellent in Development Award, and say thank you to Mr. Chuck DuPont. St. Pete DuPont. say a few words. Um, my dad uh, and mom came here 80 years ago and uh, when the war was over uh, my dad was at the Merchant Marine and he actually became uh, an officer there. Uh, my mom and dad, uh, my mom had her bag, bags all packed after the war was over. We were, and my dad had already made uh, uh, some rental agreements over there by Bartlett Park in those white cottages if you all remember those. I think they're still there, maybe a different color. But uh, my dad says, uh, I want to stay here. And my mom says, you've lost your mind. There's mosquitoes, it's hot. This is back in 1941. Uh, the, uh, it's humidity, uh, there's cockroaches, and I don't know what those other things are, lizards. And uh, my dad said, nah, he said, uh, I see something here. And I want to raise my family here. And uh, she says, I'll give you a year. And uh, so my dad went and got a job at First Federal as a messenger boy and uh, worked his way up 44 years later and retired as a vice president at uh, Florida Federal. Yeah, I think it was Florida, Florida Federal at that time. My mom wasn't a, a stay-at-home mother. Um, she actually worked at Landmark Union Trust in the trust department for 27 years. And she would take us three times, four times a week We'd uh, get on the bus. I lived at 49, 45, 6th Avenue North, 
and we'd walk to Central Avenue, get the bus, and uh, head to Web City, get our donuts, and uh, get a haircut, see the mermaids, the dancing chickens, and all that new stuff with my brothers and sisters. And then we'd, uh, we'd walk to the pier, the Million Dollar Pier, and she would dance, play bingo, and uh, just have a great time. And we watched her, and uh, we would go out and feed the pelicans and things like that. And then lunchtime, uh, we'd get some hot dogs and we'd meet my dad over at Mirror Lake, sit there on the lake and have lunch. Then we'd go back to the pier and back to Web City, and then he'd pick us up at Web City and we'd go on home. So we did that for years. And uh, at graduation uh, in high school, they were tearing down the, uh, uh, no, they were building the inverted pyramid. And uh, no, they were tearing down the, yeah, they were building the inverted pyramid. They were tearing down, tearing down the million dollar pyramid, building the inverted pyramid. And uh, I was doing a lot of construction work as a laborer uh, illegally, but um, I said, man, wouldn't that be something if I could get a job then? And I went down there to try to get a job as a laborer, and they said I was too young. So uh, it's only right, I think, now. Uh, my dad be proud of me for staying here. Uh, it was. Uh, it was the right decision. And, uh, I'm proud of uh, St. Petersburg and anything that has to do with St. Petersburg. I want to be a part of, and uh, uh, I love working here, I love my city, and I love my workers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, what Chuck didn't mention is just how, how, much, how many times he works through solutions for us at the pier. Um, and so, uh, we really, really appreciate that. And I've been over here hanging out with the bar next door, so if, you know, my words start to slur, you, you know what, what happened there. Um, but, uh, Chuck, thank you very much. Appreciate it tremendously. Uh, business development and workforce development, we're going to hit a few more slides here. Um, Want to make sure, as economic developers, we're always looking at our business community, what is happening. But what I want to point out is this slide is different because it used to say business development, and now it says business and workforce development. We changed the name, we worked with the mayor and the deputy mayor on this. Why? Because everything we do has to be tied to employment for city residents. And that's what workforce development is all about. The uh, business tax receipts for the city have, has, have gone up over the last five years, 211 more businesses in our city than five years ago. We look at net new jobs, and I've said this many times, I hate to look at when an economic development entity gets up and talks about the jobs that have been created or that they've worked on. All, I, all we really care about is net new jobs. Are we gaining in jobs or not? Uh, are we all doing that job together or not? Uh, the good news is, is we have. Uh, it increased, uh, our employment numbers increased by 1.6% last year, and between 2015 and 2019, it increased almost 6%, which is the same growth that the country has had, uh, about 6% as well. And as I, as I showed you before, kind of our employment nodes, Gateway District, Tyrone, Central Avenue along the core, downtown, Skyway Marina District, uh, 80,000 jobs, roughly 66% of our employment is represented in those nodes. Grow Smarter Industries, now this, is, this, is a, this has been a major effort by the Chamber, by the City, by the EDC, by all our economic development partners to grow these industries. Why? Because they pay more uh, and they're more sustainable. When we hit a recession, our community will be more resilient uh, because of it. Across the board, we have increased uh, from about 4,000 uh, jobs. Um, four, uh, we've had an increase uh, of 6,689 jobs in this category, uh, overall, I'm sorry, overall, over the last five years. About 4,000 of those jobs have been 
in the Grow Smarter Industries. So that's about 60% of all new jobs uh, have come over the last five years, have come due to the Grow Smarter strategy and working with those companies. We have gone from those industries representing about 29.8% of our employment to those industries now representing 32% of our employment. And that represents uh, over a five-year period a growth of 11.5% in that employment category or in those employment categories. This is, this is a community effort. It, we do it as a partnership and we have uh, the dean of our USF St. Pete, Kate Tiedemann College of Business here. Uh, dean Sri Sundaram uh, is here to talk more about the Grow Smarter Industries. Dean? Thank you very much, Alan. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, anytime you ask me to talk about Grow Smarter, it really gets my energy going, even at 4.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> so this is one of those good stories, as the deputy mayor said. I came to this community about four years ago, and when I heard about the strategy, I said, well, this is really interesting. Community coming together, the public sector, the private sector, as well as the education community and the NGO community coming together to do something very special. How many of you heard about Grow Smarter? All right, quite a few. So let's talk about making sure that we're all on the same page. Grow Smarter is an initiative that the city and the chamber came together to form to make St. Petersburg a better place to live, a better place to work, and to do business. So with that in mind, about five years ago, in 2014, they hired a consulting firm and said, let's develop an intentional plan and make this happen. So that's really what gave birth to this Grow Smarter initiative. I'm going to give you a couple of you know, three things I'm going to touch about. How well have we performed because of the strategy? What is the work yet to do? And how are we going to move this forward? So with that in mind, just wanted to show you the data. You know, again, uh, Alan just talked about the, the five sectors, the targeted sectors that we look at when you look at data analytics, financial services, marine life sciences, creative arts, and um, I think I'm missing the fifth sector, which is the creative, but I'm sorry, yep, specialized, specialized manufacturing, which is said. And when you look at each of these sectors, this was one of the things that came out of the strategy is how do we make sure we transform our community from not only being our, the, the, that's dominated by tourism, but also continue to move in a direction that allows us to kind of increase the growth in job, but also the income. And as you can see here, in every one of these sectors, we have increased double digits almost on the growth. The contribution of this strategy to the growth of the community has been significant. And as you look at the next one, you'll also see how wages have increased in each one of these sectors and contributed to the overall prosperity of the community. Tremendous effort. Again, kudos to this community for coming together and having a very clear intentional plan on how to move this community forward. This is one of the key aspects of the, the prosperity what the, that we've seen in the five years. The question always comes about is, is our work done? The answer is no. We still have some, some more work to do. When you look at the next slide, you know, we looked at, you know, some earlier we saw how much progress we have made in increasing the income for the African American community and the rest of the community. But one of the questions that comes is that, how do we make sure it is an inclusive growth? So when you look at, this is a five year average. So we have made tremendous progress, but we still have some work to do. We have some, we have to narrow the gaps by race and by place. So one of the ways we're looking at it, just looking at measuring the income, medium income. The second one is we're looking at another proxy for wealth, is home ownership. 
As you all know from research, home ownership has a huge impact on every household for generations to come. So how do we make sure that we attack both of these and we race all boats in this community? That's the work we have yet to do. And what's great about this, now we have a new partner in place, the Foundation for Healthy St. Pete, which has a mission and a mandate looking at health equity. They have also partnered now with the Chamber, as well as the City, and our rest of our partners to say, how can we contribute to the Smart Initiative and move this forward? There are two things that we have yet to do. One, our new mission is very much focused upon a mandate for inclusive prosperity, inclusive economic growth. What are our strategic priorities? There are three things. One, overall prosperity. We want to make sure every new job, as I can see JP in the back, we said absolutely. The EDC wants to bring in a new job, we are 110% behind it. But how do we make sure that these efforts go towards narrowing the gaps that we have with regard to income and with regard to race in place? How do we make sure we have an intense strategy, whether it's the workforce, Development. It is the education, the access to education, and other strategies so that we need to put in place. The third thing is really making sure that we are an inclusive community. That's one of the things. And I said, look at Chris. He said, this is a special place. Something about St. Pete that's intangible. We are a very <coughs> inclusive community. How do we continue to build that? So we want to make sure there's an intentional plan. And I, I, and I call it Gross Mark 2.0 as we look at that is, we want to move these strategic priorities forward in a very intentional fashion. This next slide talks about you know, all of the different jobs that we expect to see in the next five years. And the reason why we need an intentional plan is that if we are to start focusing on very specific sectors, we need intentionality. Second, if we are to make sure that we are going to narrow the gaps by race in place, we need intentionality. And that's where we're going to continue the work that we're doing in Grow Smarter. Again, it is an incredible partnership between the city, the chamber, foundation, and all of the other partners who come together to make this community a better place to live, to work, and to do business. And that work is going to be continued as we have a new chair. There are two people I want to very quickly introduce at the back of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the room here. Dr. Tashika Griffith, provost from St. Pete College. She's going to be taking on as the incoming chair. And also we have the manager for Gross Marla, Jocelyn Howard, again. We're going to continue the good work. They're going to be, if you're interested in engaging with the Gross Marla, please, you know, talk to them. And I want to take this opportunity to say, uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, thank you so much for your leadership and moving this forward. Greatly appreciate all of that. Chris from the Chamber, and I know Randy, I was talking to him this morning, from the Foundation, and all of the other partners, thank you so much for this opportunity, and Alan, thanks for talking, you know, allowing me to talk about this today. It's great to have that uh, academic uh, partner, uh, no matter what we do. We heard the site selection people say the same thing. Well, pretty soon here, we're going to get the mayor to come up to close this out for us. Uh, but I just want to hit a couple more slides very quickly. Uh, I'm going to just go to the greenhouse here. I just want to let everybody know that we talk about large businesses. We see that, that those articles in the newspaper, oh, we've got a big company moving and this and that. But the greenhouse, which is a partnership between the chamber and the city, Jessica Eilerman is, is in the audience, uh, they work with the small business folks on a daily basis, people with just an idea, how to go from an idea to a business, entrepreneurship, and look at the, look at the, the, the differences in the numbers uh, between 2014 and 2019. We've really ramped up our services to the small business community. Makes a huge difference because one of those small businesses is going to be the next Raymond James. <laughs> Workforce development, now this one i got to spend a second on. Um, Mayor, I'm not eating into your time, I swear to God. Um, but we are very proud of this initiative. This is St. Pete, it's called St. Pete Works. You want to talk about the Grow Smarter strategy? This is kind of putting your money where your mouth is. I mean, I, you know, a lot of people talk about inclusive prosperity, I get it, but what are we doing about it? Well, this is an example of what we're doing about it. 
this whole program is a it was initiated by the city. Uh, we have put a coalition of workforce providers. Um, they come from higher education, from uh, Career Source, uh, St. Pete College, all of our major players is a consortium, and they do one thing: they connect South St. Peter Petersburg CRA residents to employment opportunities, no matter where those opportunities are in the city. We provide funding for transportation, for childcare. If need be, um, I'm not sure I've seen another program like this in any other city. And in two years, uh, Mike Gelazzo um, with PERC has done a fantastic job leading this effort. Uh, 298 residents of the CRA in South St. Pete have been connected with employment. Uh, 178 are full-time jobs. And of those full-time jobs, um, the average salary is $12.34 right now. So this has to do with affordable housing, this has to do with paying bills, and the last thing I'll mention, just so that you know that we put our money where our mouth is, we have been meeting with St. Pete Pier, or St. Pete uh, Works, uh, with all of the hundreds of jobs that are going to be created at the pier, and having all of the future employers that are going to be located at the pier working with our workforce team so that we can make those connections. And those two meetings took place over the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Unemployment is one of the lowest in the state and in the country at 3.1%. Uh, transportation initiatives, uh, I could talk for a long time about this. Uh, the mayor, um, Evan Morey, uh, that whole team, uh, showed a lot of courage with complete streets. We took a lot of heat, a lot of pressure on that, but the fact of the matter is people are driving less. Uh, it's across the board, all the statistics say it. Um, modes of transportation are changing. We're increasing those modes as much as possible across the board. Um, and we are doing things that quite honestly five years ago would have been unheard of. I mean, we almost got killed as it was with the complete streets and the council stayed with us on this. Uh, but we're slowing traffic down. Um, we are reducing lanes. Nobody shoot me. We're reducing lanes. Uh, we're increasing pathways for pedestrians, bikers, and transit. And redu we're reducing parking requirements uh, for zoning. It is the future. Average commute time is down. We don't know exactly why, but we're going to we're going to take some credit for that. <laughs> Cost of living is down, uh, just a little. And we've got uh, sustainability in everything that we do. Council, mayor, deputy mayor, everything that we do is health in all policies. Uh, we're looking at the trap site in that respect. Every uh, RFP that we do for development includes these provisions. Um, a lot has changed in development over the last uh, 10 years. This is probably the biggest one. Um, has to be dealt with in everything that we do. And the mayor, by the way, uh, was recognized. Um, let me see if I can find this chart, Mayor. Sorry. Um, he was recognized by a major national publication as one of the top 100 people in the world who is influencing the leadership in climate change. Some big projects to come. Uh, the Arts and Crafts Museum is gonna open up. Uh, Chris, soon? Soon. soon. Uh, uh, so that's gonna be an incredible one-two punch with the Western Art Museum and then that one opening up. Some of you have seen the building, it's absolutely gorgeous. Wait till you see the inside of it. And then the city marina. Uh, we have to make a major investment there coming off the pier, and we will have to do that, and we'll be discussing that with the council in the days ahead. But that is coming. And finally, uh, every year we do a scorecard. Um, and uh, we say, OK, uh, in all of our measures, we measure 43 indicators, economic development indicators. Uh, 41 of them improved this year. 
Uh, we measure our progress against peers. Uh, 10 out of our 15 measures with peers, uh, we did better than our peers. Uh, and that was uh, 60, about a 66% um, in, in the top half. And then finally, and this is the one that uh, jumps out at me, um, especially in light of economic development corporations over in Tampa and Hillsboro changing their name uh, to Tampa Bay um, and not representing the whole Bay, not representing St. Pete. I now know why, because as you can see, St. Pete surpasses the MSA in 12 out of the 14 statistical areas. So they need our data to make it work. Um, but in all seriousness, it shows that when we talk about the MSA, when we talk about the good numbers uh, to anybody in the MSA, St. Peter, Petersburg is driving a good portion of that good news. Okay, so that, I, I thank you for hanging in there with us, going through these slides. I have one more slide, but no statistics. Uh, but I am going to introduce the architect of what has been done over the last five years in conjunction with all of you. Uh, somebody who's very humble, uh, but very focused at the same time. Uh, someone that uh, makes most of the final decisions for the city in conjunction with the, with the council. Our architect, our conductor, our leader, Mayor Richard Chrysler. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, we're about a, an hour and a half into this already, and uh, uh, <clears throat> so I recognize, uh, as a politician, I like to talk, but uh, I also recognize I'm the one thing that's between you and the bar, uh, so I promise to keep my comments below two hours. Um, and before I get into my comments, uh, Chuck, why are you still here? We've got a period to finish. So. <laughs> um, but before I, I uh, begin my concluding comments, I did want to take a few moments to offer my thanks uh, to those on my staff and in this community of ours who, uh, through their hard work and passion, have helped us achieve our goals and reach these incredible numbers and statistics that you all have seen today. <clears throat> Please understand the list of thank yous is not all inclusive, as to do so would mean we would literally be here for at least another hour. But on my team, let me start with uh, those who not only made this event happen, uh, but helped us create the magic uh, that happens throughout the year, uh, starting with my awesome Deputy Mayor and City Administrator, Dr. Kanika Tomlin, and my Assistant City Administrator, Tom Green. Obviously, the man who oversees all things economic development in this city, the amazing Alan Delisle. Really put together a highly committed and competent team. Our marketing director, uh, Nina Mamudi, and her entire team, who have done an outstanding job of telling the story of St. Petersburg, not only in this region, but throughout the state and the nation. I also want to thank all of my administrators, our police and fire chiefs, and all 3,000 plus city employees for really helping to create the great quality of life that we all get to enjoy. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have great partners in the private sector, starting with the president and CEO of the chamber and my ribbon-cutting partner, <laughs> extraordinaire, Chris Steinacher. <laughs> in the back of the room, the CEO of the St. Petersburg EDC, J.P. DeVue. <laughs> and the CEO of the downtown partnership, Jason Mathis. So you know, when, when you make a decision that it's time to move, uh, and you begin the process of looking at houses, you kind of have an idea of what you're looking for in that house. You can see the house online, and it, it might look great, but it's not until you walk inside the house that you can decide whether it's the right one, the one that you were looking for. Now, you might walk inside the house and say, nope, 
look good online, look good on paper, but it's, it's just not right. You might say, it's not exactly what I was looking for, but it has good bones. And with a little work, it can be exactly what you're looking for. Now that was St. Petersburg seven years ago when I decided to run for mayor. I had walked into the house that was St. Petersburg and thought, this is a nice house. It's a nice community. It has good bones. But there's something missing. Something that with just a little bit of work would take it to the next level. That would make it exactly what we were looking for. So I called upon the knowledge that I had gained during my six years on city council and six years in the legislature to try and determine what was missing, what I could do to take St. Petersburg to that next level. To become that house that you walk into and you say, this is it. This is the place that I want to call home that my children and their children and all of our children will want to call home for the rest of our lives. So I started with crafting a vision of what I wanted St. Petersburg to be. We thought it was important that we know who we want to be so we know what direction we're going into and we could take people in that direction. St. Petersburg will be a city of opportunity, you've probably heard me say this a gazillion times, and I'll keep saying it, a city of opportunity that where the sun shines on all who come to live, work, and play. That we will be an innovative, creative, and a competitive community that honors its past as we pursue our future. Now, one of the things that I knew from my time on council and from my time in the legislature is that when you're trying to attract businesses to a community and you're competing with other cities and regions all over the country, they all have incentives that they can throw at those businesses to try and attract them to come to their community, whether it's Charlotte or Nashville or Boston or any of them, Seattle, Portland, doesn't matter. They've all got the incentives. So when you're talking to businesses about what makes the difference, it's the intangibles. It's the quality of life. It's the culture. It's the feel. It's the soul. That's what makes the difference. And that's what we tried to focus on. That's what we tried to create with that vision statement of who we wanted to be, to create that soul in the city, to become a city that is diverse, that is inclusive, that is kind, that is compassionate. So that when companies like Dynasty are looking around the country and thinking, where are we going to land? Where is the best place for us to be as a business where we can grow our business, where our not only the people who work currently for us, but those we try and attract to our company will want to live. They chose St. Pete. They went to Tampa. They went to other cities. Somebody told them, go across the bay and see what's going on there. And they came here and they felt it. They sensed it. And that's the difference. That's the magic of St. Pete. That's what we focused on, my entire team, all 3,000 and plus employees focus on every day is how do we create the magic, the soul, that special feeling? Chris and I, we, get, we have such an honor that we get to experience it every time we're doing a groundbreaking or a ribbon cutting. It's families. It's individuals who are living their passion and their dreams who oftentimes break down crying because they, this is what they've dreamt of, and they're getting to do it in a place that opens their arms and welcomes them here, where they feel comfortable. And so... Whether it's through arts and culture, and I'm a huge believer, as I stand in this magnificent museum, that arts and culture is a huge part of what makes this city the special place it is. I'm lucky. I get to brag. Every time I go to a U.S. conference, a mayor's event, and there's three, 400 other mayors there, I get to say, well, how many museums do you have, uh, cities that are my size or bigger? Because we got more. And we got great ones. And we got another great one that's coming. Or you just walk around downtown and the entire city has become a museum with all the murals that are on the walls. It's open to everyone. That makes the arts accessible to everyone. To be the home of the Florida Orchestra and the St. Pete Opera Company here in St. Petersburg. To have great sporting events like we have, whether it's the Rowdies or the Rays or the IndyCar race is the first of the year every year for IndyCar here in the streets of St. Petersburg to have a waterfront park system that's one of the largest in the country. It's quality of life, and it's the people, and it's that kindness and the compassion. So when we raise the Carter G. Woodson flag over City Hall to recognize African American History Month, when we have the largest, one of the largest MLK parades in the country 
here in St. Petersburg. When we have 250,000 people come here for St. Pete Pride, and for five years in a row, we have scored a perfect 100 on the Municipal Equality Index. That says something about who this community is. This is a community that is welcoming, that is tolerant, that is diverse, and that when you come here, and Dynasty will tell you, and every other business who's come here will tell you this, you feel like you are a part of the community instantly, like this is your home, and that's you all. You all have helped create that along with us in partnership. Because government can't do it all by themselves, nor should we. It has to be a partnership. And it's all of you all who have done that. You created these numbers. And the exciting thing is, is we're just getting started. There is so much more room for all of us if we all work together as a community to continue to rise this city up. But we do it in a way when we're growing, we grow smart, and we don't lose our character, and we don't lose what makes us special. And we can do that. We can chew gum and walk at the same time. Yes, we can. And we will do that. And that's what excites me more than anything. So I just want to end my comments by saying thank you to all of you for being such an important part of this community, for helping us to get these numbers. We're going to do better next year. I'm confident of that. And it's with all of your help. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.